Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this afternoon's briefing that is being brought to you once again by the Environmental and Energy Study Institute, EESI, and also the Novum Group. My name is Carol Werner, and I'm the Executive Director of the Environmental and Energy Study Institute. This afternoon's briefing is entitled, Warning Signs, a new report outlines the impacts of proposed budget cuts to climate and environmental research. So big question is, why do we care about this? What's the significance of this? The report that has been done by the Novum Group helps bring to all of us extremely important information about proposed budget cuts that were proposed last year with regard to fiscal uh, 2018. Those same budget cuts, many of which are proposed for this year's budget for fiscal 2019, are continuing. There is a, a significant large discussion among policymakers about what should the budget look like, why, what's important. And I think that it is very incumbent upon all of us to really look carefully at this important report so that we can better fully understand what really is at stake. Why do we care about environmental climate science? Why do we care about getting the facts straight? What are the facts? And what kinds of impacts does this have upon all of us, upon our lives today, upon the agencies that it impacts, upon all of their constituencies, users of data, of scientific research, and indeed the impacts that we see upon what goes forward in terms of all of those students who are training in today's colleges and universities, in terms of the important continuum of research that has extraordinary impacts upon all of us. I should also say that the Environmental and Energy Study Institute is particularly concerned because as we do all of our briefings for policymakers, we always remember that this organization was formed back in the mid 80s by a bipartisan congressional caucus that was very concerned about energy and environmental issues, how we could learn more to create a better informed policy discussion, and how we could build relationships and networks across all sectors in the pursuit of finding solutions to very important energy and environmental problems that we're confronting our country, but that also means issues that confront the world because we all are very interconnected. One of the things that I found in terms of looking at the report, and as you will see in terms of looking at even the outline, these, the um, table of contents in this report, are all of the agencies that are affected. And what's critical is that we cannot approach anything in terms of a silo. It's very important to understand the important role that each of these 13 agencies that are specifically looked at, the role that they play and how incumbent it is upon those employees, all of the research, all of the R&D that they fund, that the interrelationships, that the interconnectedness of all of this be understood and that, and that it indeed uh, be seen as the very complementary work um, that it indeed is. If we are going to get science right, if we are going to get our facts right, if we are really going to make the kind of difference that we need to make. So I am first going to uh, turn to uh, Dr. Ari Petrinos, who is the Chief Scientist um, and Director for Research of the Novum Group. The Novum Group uh, is the group that put together this important uh, study. Um, and the Novum Group, uh, in terms of putting together this report, drew upon the expertise of, of scientists, of researchers that had worked in both Republican and Democratic uh, administrations. Uh, so there is first-rate work that has been done as well as work by people who've been leaders in um, uh, high, high level and, and very um, across-the-board uh, research uh, in the federal government. 
The Novum Group is a nonprofit scientific research organization that has been deeply committed to its role as an independent non-advocacy source of data to provide clear options to the most urgent problems facing humanity. Dr. Petrinos, as I said, uh, is the chief scientist for Novum, uh, but prior to, uh, prior to going to Novum, he had he had spent 20 years um, in, the, in the government at the Department of Energy, where he directed biological and environmental research at DOE, including very important contributions to the U.S. Global Change Research Program, as well as the Human Genome Project. He has uh, been on the, the staff, has worked with three of our very well-known, important national laboratories. And during, during 2016, Dr. Petrinos was also a senior advisor to then Secretary of Energy uh, Ernie Moniz for biomedical applications, where he also worked on the joint efforts of DOE with the Nance National Cancer Institute and the Department of Veterans Administration. All right. Thank you, Carol, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, and thank you for braving this Arctic weather to, to be with us today. And, and, and by the way, maybe I shouldn't say that because the Arctic is probably enjoying much milder temperatures than we have been. Um, special thanks to the uh, uh, Environmental and Energy Study Institute and to uh, Amory Laporte for uh, helping us also put this uh, together. Uh, as you've heard from Carol, I'm the uh, chief scientist of the Novim Group, as well as the director for research at Novim. Um, we, uh, as Novim, have been around since 2008. And uh, as Carol has told you, we are a not-for-profit group, which we try and also not to uh, advocate, although sometimes our passions get away from us and we do advocate, and, uh, and maybe sometimes advocacy is not a bad thing. Uh, we conduct and publish studies uh, that are science-based, uh, but also are important both nationally and internationally. Uh, at, created in 2008, it's, uh, it is based at the Kavli Institute for Theoretical Physics at the University of California in Santa Barbara. There is a... Uh, uh, this slide, the one slide that we have, which is another way of describing it, uh, is to have as its charter to use an assembly of scientists to break down complex scientific issues in such a way as to render them comprehensible to non-scientists. Um, <clears throat> we uh, want to say, I don't know how many of you are familiar with the Jason group, uh, which is a... Uh, a group of uh, academics and, uh, and other scientists that convene uh, once a year in, uh, in, in uh, San Diego and have conducted over the years many studies on behalf of the Department of Defense, the intelligence community, and since I became involved, also for the Department of Energy. It was uh, originally primarily just physicists and engineers and mathematicians, but again, Perhaps with, uh, with my help, it has also entrained biologists and environmental scientists. So one of our uh, members of the advisory committee that we have has called the Novim uh, efforts as uh, Jason for the masses. I have been involved as a participant scientist in the Novim group since 2009 uh, when we launched one of the studies that was in uh, geoengineering for climate change mitigation. Uh, this was one of the first efforts along those, along those lines, and it focused primarily on the use of, uh, of, uh, of emitting uh, sulfate aerosols in the stratosphere to change the albedo of the Earth. And we covered both scientific issues, engineering issues, as well as uh, non-intended consequences, which has always been something of of importance. Since that time, there have been many studies, including studies by the National Academy of Sciences. Uh, we don't advocate that geoengineering is something we should be doing, but I think it's important that we do the research in case somebody else does it so that we are 
aware of the possible consequences of such an action that uh, uh, I, would, I would condemn personally, at least at this stage. Um, another, another study that was conducted was uh, uh, dealing with methane leak leakages in the, in the US, uh, which is something that became quite uh, appropriate and relevant uh, in the final couple, uh, a couple of years of the Obama administration when he had a serious methane leakage problem in uh, Southern California. Another one uh, of the studies that uh, received a lot of attention and had significant impact was one about the Earth's surface temperature trends uh, that uh, was something contested during the debates about climate change. And uh, in fact, that particular study uh, ended up uh, pretty much uh, uh, validating the prevailing scientific consensus about the impacts of climate change on uh, the average uh, global surface temperatures. And there were actually congressional hearings along those lines, and uh, some of the scientists involved in that particular study testified. Uh, something else that was not along those usual lines that uh, Novim has done in the past is the development of a software package uh, to probe employee pension scenarios. This is another, another acute problem that many of our cities uh, in this country are facing. It's a software package that allows policymakers, uh, mayors and their staff to examine possible scenarios to deal with the problem of um, the pension. We hope to make that available this year for broad uh, dissemination and application. Ongoing another effort is an IPCC, uh, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change Education on Climate Issues, and that's done in, uh, in cooperation and in collaboration with the National Geographic. Also currently uh, is the awards of the Jane Noble um, Awards for Science Writing, another issue that has become so important in terms of communicating scientific results um, to policymakers and the general public. Since I uh, became uh, chief scientist with the help of the advisory committee that we set up, uh, the first study we launched was one about the future of nuclear energy in this country. We called it American Nuclear Energy at the Crossroads because we are truly, with respect to nuclear energy, at the crossroads and we can go left and totally um, abandon nuclear energy, or we can perhaps be more sensible and not do that. Uh, and many of the reasons why we think uh, should be that way in terms of going right is very much articulated and included in the report that we published that is available online at the uh, Novim uh, website. Uh, the last study that we did is the study is the study that is uh, on our agenda today, and I'm uh, uh, very very pleased to have uh, Kay Koizomi be the presenter of those results. As you've heard from Carol, uh, we were uh, very successful in convening a group of individuals who had really deep uh, and extensive knowledge of the issues that will be presented in this report. Um, it's something as you've uh, perhaps uh, surmised already from what Carol said, something that's very near and dear to my heart because of the long involvement as a founder of the U.S. Global Change Research Program, uh, Public Law 101, 606, I still remember that, of 1990. Uh, and um, you'll get the details from uh, Kay, and uh, uh, we will be available also for questions afterwards. Uh, like you've heard those from Carol, uh, our plan is always when we do studies of this kind to be very, very non-advocate, adv to um, employ not advocacy. And like I like to say, we like to do this particular analysis in a very dispassionate way so that it can be used by policymaker in terms of making decisions about the future of many of these important programs uh, that have been in effect for many years and have made major contributions to our understanding about environmental and climate issues. So, Carol. 
Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much for those um, opening comments and to explain about the wealth of information and uh, and studies that are available uh, through Novum and through the website and all of the research that has been pulled together. I now want to turn to our next presenter who has made major contribution to this whole report and he brings a wealth of experience and Mr. K. Koizumi is uh, currently senior advisor uh, at the American Association for the Advancement of Science, AAAS, as many of us often refer to it. And uh, Kay had joined the Office of Science and Technology Policy, a, a White House agency, back in 2009, where he was the Assistant Director for Federal Research and Development as part of the uh, um, uh, Technology uh, and, and uh, industry uh, council, and uh, which is an important uh, council of the uh, OSTP, the Office of Science and Technology Policy. That White House office was deeply involved in terms of working with people across all of the agencies in terms of trying to coordinate, understand uh, research and scientific needs, technology needs, uh, and to really look at things in a holistic fashion. Uh, <clears throat> in, in addition, uh, before joining OSTP in 2009, as I mentioned, uh, Kay had served as the director of the R&D Budget and Policy Program at AAAS. So he brings a wealth of information and deep understanding with regard to understanding budgets, their impact upon policy, and what that means for the kinds of analysis that needs to be done in terms of putting together budgets and also looking at their impacts and following all of that through. So I, we will now really have uh, Kay walk us through this report, what its key findings are, the implications of those, and following his um, uh, presentation of this study, we will open it up for your questions. Thank you. Kay. Well, thank you, and hello. I th there we are, good. Um, we're here today and thanks to Novum and ESI for allowing us to be here today. We are here today because the President's 2018 and 2019 budget propose significant reductions to many climate and environment related research and development programs. So Congress is still deliberating, maybe as we speak, on 2018 appropriations. And that's one reason that we are here in Washington, D.C. today to talk about the report. Uh, we are also here because the 2019 budget proposal, which was released a few weeks ago, follows a remarkably similar course for climate and environment R&D as the course set in the 2018 proposal. So this report, we think, is relevant for both 2018 funding and for 2019 funding. So I am Kei Koizumi, uh, and I'm a member of the bipartisan team that authored this report. So I'm here because I'm a longtime budget watcher for science funding at AAAS, as you heard, um, and I also worked at OSTP until well, early 2017. Uh, I have to say that I'm involved in this report in my personal capacity and not representing AAAS. Uh, that's the disclaimer that I picked up while I was in the federal government that I have to. Yeah. Um, so this report is intended to inform policymakers in Congress and the executive branch, the scientific community, and the general public of the risks to America's economic, societal, and environmental security and leadership if the environment and climate R&D cuts proposed in the 2018 budget and the 2019 budget become a reality. So this Novum report, which you have uh, hard copies of, I hope, uh, it finds that federally sponsored climate and environment R&D, or for short, CERD, uh, the R&D policy and operational pr programs that we've gathered together in this report are critical to climate and environment observations, and they are also critical to international programs supporting climate and environment efforts globally. 
Uh, these programs total $7.9 billion in the administration's 2018 budget. And that is a $2.0 billion or 21 percent cut from the fiscal year 2017 funding level. Needless to say, that is a fairly dramatic cut in, in budgetary terms. You know, we found that CERND described in the report spans 13 federal departments and independent agencies. And all but two of those agencies, the Department of Defense and the Smithsonian, would see dramatic cuts in their CERND funding in this 2018 budget. We haven't formally done the analysis on the 2019 budget, uh, but the 2019 budget would have a higher total, but is still likely to be a dramatic cut of greater than 10 percent to these programs. So my colleagues and I participated in this project because we care deeply about these C and R&D investments and the benefit they bring to the American people. Some of us have been working on these programs, working with these programs for a long time, in, in some cases decades. Uh, climate and environment research and development play an important role in our ability to address the problems we face as a nation and remain a vibrant nation in the 21st century. Through its investments in research, observations, modeling, assessments, workforce development, and working effectively with other nations. So those are the themes that we tried to, to lay out in this report. So I presented the budget table. The budget table, those are numbers. Those are the, the kind of numbers that I'm used to presenting. But most of what I'm talking about today is not about the numbers. It's about the impact of those investments and what they mean for the nation. So the U.S. government's investments in CARD play an important role in our nation's ability to address many problems, including reliable and economical access to safe food, water, and energy, resiliency to natural and human hazards that threaten our health and national security, and avoiding negative impacts on the environment while maintaining a vibrant economy. Funding cuts of the magnitude proposed in the 2018 and 2019 budgets would threaten our ability to meet these challenges. The proposed cuts to federal CERND would, if they become law in 2018 appropriations, have devastating impacts on U.S. capabilities. And the same is true for the 2019 budget cuts becoming law in 2019 appropriations. So the report finds that the proposed cuts would, number one, dismantle programs to provide the scientific foundation for agencies to protect effectively the health, economic prosperity, and safety of the American people. Two, they would break the continuity and integrity of longstanding and future observations and research infrastructure needed for climate and environment modeling. Three, they would undermine our ability to detect and understand critical climate and environment trends and influences on natural resources. Four, they would reduce our ability to train the next generation of scientists, resource managers, and decision makers who can work together to translate science into effective climate and environment policies and approaches. And five, they would diminish the nation's ability to meet legal and international climate and environment commitments. So these five things that I uh, laid out map onto the five themes of the report that you have in your hands. And the report makes clear that these impacts would reverberate throughout American society. My colleagues and I have grouped these, uh, uh, the impact of this 21 percent cut to federal CERD into these five uh, themes, and we've labeled them as investment and capacity, observations and modeling adaptation assessments, workforce, and international commitments. So let me talk about each of them in turn. Let me start with investment in capacity. First, the proposed cuts re represent a dramatic loss of investment in capacity to conduct CERND. They undermine the scientific foundation for agencies to protect effectively the health, economic prosperity, and safety of Americans. The cuts being proposed would result in a significant reduction in the number, size, and duration of CERND program awards, such as grants and contracts, in both the intramural and the extramural R&D operations of the federal government. For example, 
Reductions in the NSF budget will result in approximately 800 fewer awards in climate and environment R&D, adversely impacting the careers of an estimated 2,500 people and a reduction of nearly 50 percent of the academic research fleet by 2030, absent further investment. Second, the proposed cuts to EPA that I outlined in this report would eliminate entirely EPA support to universities and industry for all disciplines, not just the CERD disciplines. Third, for NIH, the 2018 budget would reduce the number of new National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences, or NIEHS, research awards to universities by 20 percent, reduce the average size of a new NIEHS research award by 20 percent, reduce the success rates for all new NIH awards from 18 percent in 2016 to 14 percent, and reduce intramural or NIH-conducted NIH-EHS research by at least 20 percent. These cuts, along with steep cuts to NOAA and U.S. Geological Survey research, combined would result in a dramatic reduction of federal support for environmental health sciences research, including research to improve our understanding of hazardous contaminants that are dangerous to humans. You know, if sustained, these reductions will result in a loss of new knowledge, the possible closure of federal labs and academic centers, and a decline in the education and training of the next generation of environmental scientists. Second, we're in danger of losing climate and environmental observations and modeling. We're in danger of breaking the continuity and integrity of long-standing and future observations and the research infrastructure needed to enable climate and environment modeling. Long-term continuous and consistent observation records have been a hallmark of U.S. investments for decades. And these observations are dependent on a variety of research observing networks and facilities, including satellites, ocean buoys, long-term ecological research, stream gauge and groundwater monitoring, the academic research fleet, marine laboratories, and field stations. Most of these networks and facilities are being stressed significantly by the 2018 budget proposals, and they are repeated in the 2019 budget. For example, four key NASA climate environment satellite missions will be terminated in the 2018 and the 2019 budgets. These missions are part of a coordinated approach for initiating and enabling long-term global observations of the land surface, the biosphere, atmosphere, and oceans, and they provide the continu continuation of key measurements that are needed for understanding what's happening to our planet. For NOAA, the 2018 budget would terminate several surface and marine observations carried out by the National Weather Service, including the tsunami warning system and the mid-range weather outlook. Again, these are important data that we need to understand what's happening to the planet right now. For the Department of Energy, Cuts to climate and integrated assessment modeling that range from 58 percent to complete program termination will slow progress toward using computers for models with greater certainty of predictions and greater prediction capabilities at regional scales. And that's precisely the type of information that can inform planning and adaptation strategies at the state level and the local level. Although funding for most of the Department of Energy's Office of Science was restored in the 2019 budget, the cuts to these programs are repeated in the 2019 budget. So let me talk about adaptation and assessments. In adaptation and assessments, these proposed cuts threaten to undermine our ability to detect and understand critical climate and environment trends and influences on natural resources. The loss of these critical measurements will limit the ability of governments, businesses, and citizens to improve their decision-making processes for both short and long-term environmental issues. These types of global data are critical for addressing societal challenges in food, water, and energy security. They inform decisions on how best to mitigate and ad adapt to the effects of environmental change for the general well-being of society. For example, NOAA provides competitive funding to assist communities in their efforts to strengthen their resilience in the face of severe weather and other environmental changes. 
many of these efforts will be weakened by the 2018 and 2019 budget proposals. Second, energy and water are interdependent. Energy use is water intensive, and water treatment and delivery is energy intensive. DOE has been a leader in integrated assessments of this energy water nexus, using data, modeling, and analysis to improve understanding and to inform decision making about energy and water for a broad range of users and on multiple scales. In the 2018 budget, the DOE Energy Water Nexus program is being cut by 87 percent and put on the path to termination by the end of this fiscal year. That would reduce our national capacity to prepare for and meet coming increased demands for food, energy, and water. Third, the information modeling and tools that are produced by the U.S. Geological Survey are used by the government and the private sector to support adaptive management strategies, such as managing forests during severe droughts, anticipating changes in permafrost, glaciers, and wildlife patterns in the Arctic, and understanding flood-related risk. The cuts to USGS programs will severely impact our ability to adapt and respond to our changing environment, including responding to uh, extreme weather events. And USGS is one example of the 2019 budget proposing even steeper cuts than those in the 2018 budget. So fourth, the workforce. These cuts would threaten our ability to train the next generation of scientists, resource managers, and decision makers who can work together to translate science into effective climate and environment policies and approaches. Federal research funding fuels our ability to conduct important research, but also educate and train the next generation of scientists and engineers. Reduced academic research funding will have a short-term impact on individual projects, but will have a longer-term impact on the technical workforce. Students' decisions to follow a career path are impacted by their perceptions of future funding and support of the field or industry. If proposed reductions in R&D funding in the climate and environment agencies are implemented, fewer undergraduates will have the opportunity to gain hands-on research experience that have been shown to prepare them for scientific careers. As I said earlier, cuts to NSF in the CE R&D portfolio will reduce support for up to 2,500 people, including senior scientists, but also postdoctoral students, graduate and undergraduate students, and research technicians. Although these cuts are less severe in the 2019 budget, there are still projections of fewer people being supported by NSF in the 2019 budget. Now, these workforce cuts could happen as some of the greatest economic competitors of the United States are moving aggressively into the green economy for um, and are putting into place strategies to take over renewable energy, clean energy industries. So let me turn now to the fifth uh, theme in the report, which is that the 2018 and 2019 budgets would diminish our nation's ability to meet legal and international climate and environment commitments. First of all, the Department of State and U.S. Agency for International Development will be impacted by the largest cut in both dollars and percentage of all the climate and environment programs in this report. You will see on the budget table that for these agencies combined, it's an 87% proposed cut. There's not much left after an 87% cut. Uh, while state and USAID don't fund CERND programs per se, they do support diplomatic and financial mechanisms to help influence, shape, and implement international CE policies and agreements. The proposed DO, Department of State USAID reductions and terminations threaten the nation's ability to meet these legal and international climate commitments, many of which have resulted from more than 20 years of U.S. leadership and negotiations with other nations around the world. Second, reductions to these key NASA satellite programs that I mentioned earlier will also impact ongoing international commitments the United States has with other nations on climate and environment observational systems, open sharing of data resulting from these satellite missions, and the ability to monitor key measurements that are critical parts of international climate and environment agreements. Enforcing and monitoring compliance with these international agreements often depends on the satellite data 
of such as the satellite data that are provided by NASA satellites. And third, the EPA also has a range of CERND efforts supporting international agreements that are targeted for reductions or for terminations. The pros, proposed 2018 budget would, as a start, reduce support for clean air allowance trading programs. Second, all but eliminate the U.S. greenhouse gas reporting program. Third, diminish EPA's capacity to prepare the statutorily mandated annual inventory of U.S. gas, greenhouse gas emissions and sink. Four, end several environmental partnership programs. And fifth, eliminate U.S. government funding for the multilateral fund for the implementation of the Montreal Port Protocol, which is on stratospheric ozone. Let me also add that funding reductions would reduce these agencies' support for the interagency U.S. Global Change Research Program. This will hinder the nation's ability to contribute to major international negotiations regarding climate change and the necessary and appropriate adaptation measures that must be undertaken. So these are some of the important capabilities that are at stake as Congress, the American people, and the executive branch debate final 2018 funding for the U.S. government before moving on to 2019 funding. You know, as we talk today, somewhere in this building or across the street, we, uh, we know that Congress is trying to uh, wrap up the 2018 appropriations. And we know that Congress so far has signaled a reluctance to go along with many of these proposed cuts uh, as it tries to finalize 2018 appropriations. The draft appropriations bills from the House and the Senate have in many cases rejected the proposed cuts. But in the report, we express concern that as Congress looks to wrap up these 2018 appropriations, some of the proposed cuts could be sustained. Uh, the report also warns that the administration's 2019 budget contains many of the same cuts as those proposed for 2018. Therefore, the significant reductions to the C and R&D program could very well happen in 2019, even if the cuts are avoided uh, in next week, I hope it's next week, next week's 2018 Omnibus Appropriations Bill. So my colleagues and I intend to keep following this important portfolio of programs as we move from budget year to budget year. So thank you for listening today. Uh, this report is going out to decision, decision makers, the scientific community, the American people, congressional staff, anyone who will listen, so they can understand what's at stake right now from the decisions Congress is making, I think they're making it this week, uh, with 2018 funding of climate and environment R&D, and also what's at stake from decisions the administration and Congress are going to make in 2019 and years to come. So here are the warning signs. And at stake, we see, we see is nothing less than Americans' economic, societal, and environmental security and leadership because all of these depend on our ability to investigate and understand our planet and our environment. So thank you very much for listening to this report, and I'm very happy to take questions on behalf of myself and the author team. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thanks so very much, Kay, for, for walking us through and explaining um, the the conclusions right. and those extremely important messages. I know so many times as I think about this, and I really do encourage you all to let others know about this important report and to make sure that you really do read it yourself. Uh, but so many times I, as I think about projected cuts, if, if a program disappears, if an area of research disappears, you can't just put it back all that easily two years later, whatever, because you've really interrupted something very important and you can't just do that. And I know that from talking to people to listening to people over the last 25 years in terms of thinking about what happens to budgets and policy and research. A couple other things that, as you were talking about some of these important budgets in terms of thinking about NASA and NOAA and the U.S. Geological Survey, um, the Department of Energy, et cetera, that, that we have seen so many times that, that as we look at 
so many things that are going on now with more and more extreme weather events. We are hearing from local and state government officials. Um, we are hearing from them, particularly through a, a whole series of resilience forums that EESI has been putting together over the last couple of years. We are hearing very clearly from them how important the tools and the information are that are coming from these very agencies, from these 13 agencies that are part of the U.S. Change Global Research Program. And that they, frankly, depend upon so much of this data and access to researchers in order to do their own planning locally in terms of thinking about flood zones, thinking about how to do adaptation planning, um, what kinds of warnings for their citizens, et cetera. So that has made a profound impact in terms of my hearing directly from people um, about that. And the third thing I would just mention for all of us to remember is that the Government Accountability Office, GAO, has for the last several years been putting climate uh, at uh, very high on their risk factors in terms of its significance as a threat to federal facilities, the need to address those kinds of issues posed by climate change and how we um, deal with it. And because it does have a big impact upon our infrastructure at the federal level in terms of what we're seeing, as well as at the state and local level. And, um, and in fact, um, it, we hope to bring in folks from uh, GAO to really talk about um, their concern about this threat to the U.S. economy and to um, uh, federal infrastructure as well. So let us now open it up for any questions, comments that you may have. And if you could just wait for the microphone if you've got a question. Okay, we'll start here. Hi, um, I'm Elizabeth McGowan. I write for the Energy News Network. And I wanted to focus on workforce. Um, if you could talk about a lot of people, you know, the federal government, when I interview people who work there, it's it's sort of a calling. It's a little different species of person who goes to work there. And when if these signals are being sent that we don't have time or money for you, what are the options for aspiring scientists? Where else do they do? Go? Do they go overseas, industry, academia? What could you talk a little about that? Yes, happy to. So that gives me a chance to talk about uh, one part of the report where we try to look at the workforce impacts. And, you know, we go to uh, organizations like the American Geosciences Institute, uh, which has d d does workforce surveys, and they're already f uh, predicting a shortage of 135,000 geoscientists by 2022. And the geoscientists that may go missing are exploration geophysicists, hydrologists, petroleum geologists, and economic geologists, for example. Now, most of these uh, professionals are working in the private sector, such as for oil companies state uh, and state governments, state agencies, et cetera. But we find that, of course, many of them get their training through our public and private universities, through graduate programs that are substantially funded by these research agencies that I'm talking about. Most of them have gone through graduate school because they were, had a fellowship that was paid in part by the National Science Foundation. They were on a research project through their professor who was funded by the U.S. Geological Survey or the Environmental Protection Agency. Or they also did uh, postdoctoral uh, postdocs at um, Environmental Protection Agency laboratories, et cetera. So that's why even for uh, scientists who will go on to careers in private industry, that federal investment is so crucial for, to making sure that they have the opportunity to contribute either in the private or the public sector. Ari, did you want to add anything? Okay. Uh, uh, my first question would have been what to do. Uh, uh, despite what GAO, or in addition to what GAO is suggesting, uh, at least until last year, the Department of Defense was uh, stressing the importance of 
the potential of climate change, and I don't know if that's oh, changed. Oh, and they still are. They still uh, are. I did not know if that had, might have changed. But uh, just with regard to the answer to the last question, uh, it would be interesting to quantify the workforce that's not professional, not well educated. Uh, one of the uh, reasons to the extent that it's been successful in my local jurisdiction advocating for uh, state uh, legislation is that there are a potential of jobs for people who won't be graduate students who uh, uh, refine their uh, knowledge gain in public in through public uh, university. So if you could speak to that, I would be interested. I'm not sure what there is to add I mean, because, well, first of all, the what to do, uh, that's up to all of us. That's up to you. That's up to all of us. Uh, and so I'm not going to suggest anything there. But in terms of the broader workforce, that is a direction that we could have taken. Uh, we, well, for a couple of reasons, we didn't. But you're right uh, that many of the industries uh, that depend on this federally supported CEA R&D enterprise are industries that employ a vast number and vast diversity of people. Uh, if you take a, just a look at, you know, I was used, extending my geologist example, of course, oil companies, fracking, the fracking technologies that make possible many skilled and unskilled jobs have at their base federal investments in these types of programs, in understanding geology, understanding you know, uh, the impact of water on, on rocks, I mean, simple as that. But out of that comes, you know, a basis, well, one of the few areas in, in which U.S. industry has made great strides and has really moved the needle on the composition of our energy sources. And with that, of course, comes thousands of jobs, both for these geologists I talked about earlier, but also oil wor rig workers, uh, people who work in the field of, of fracking sites. So that's the kind of example, I think, of the broader impact of these climate and environmental research and development programs uh, beyond just the, f the, the scientific and engineering workforce that we talked about primarily in this report. Okay. Thank you very much. My name is Michael Zwern. I'm at Resources for the Future. Um, I, um, I understand that the general tendency is to look at the physical and the biological sciences in terms of the science R&D investments. But I'm also very interested in the decision sciences and uh, research and investment in economics, policy making, and other areas where the federal agency budgets invest in a lot of R&D that is carried out by universities, think tanks, et cetera. Could you talk a little bit more about the, uh, the social sciences impacts of these R&D cuts, if you can disaggregate that a little bit? Thank you. As a social scientist, I'm going to enjoy this question. Um, uh, thank you for the opportunity. Well, and you're right that you know the social and behavioral and economic sciences are an important part of this conversation. Um, they are not well captured in the purview of this report, but certainly these investments in the CER and D uh, area are you know, supported and complemented by a lot of agency investments in the social sciences. I mean, of course, at the Department of the Interior, uh, Department of the Interior, as of a few years ago, was making investments in decision science and, you know, creating a new occupational category of decision, decision sciences. And one of the things that I was, you know, working on at OSTP was expanding um, the availability of decision science and other social science talent to aid, you know, physical and natural science agencies, uh, because they are important, uh, because all of these uh, R&D insights that are gained from the investments we talk about in this report have an audience, and a lot of the audience is decision making by these federal agencies. And there is a, there's an emerging science around how you best incorporate scientific information into making decisions that natural resources agencies have to make as a matter of course. I mean, every week there is some decision to be made about, you know, listing or delisting an endangered species or, you know, allowing or not allowing logging or natural resource extraction in a certain part of a public land. Um, and so the agencies are finding the value in integrating social sciences and the natural sciences. Um, and, well, 
what we can say from the report is that one part of that, the physical science base of that, is being endangered by the report. And although I have not, we haven't done uh, an analysis of the social science consequence of that, uh, I'm a little bit afraid to. Uh, maybe that's the next project. Ari. Uh, as one of the funders of the U.S. Global Change Research Program, uh, I have to do a mea culpa. Uh, I and many of uh, my colleagues in the early days of the program were almost entirely focused on the physical and uh, chemical aspects of, of climate change. And um, through the last uh, 20 years plus, we've been humbled by our realization that we were quite wrong, very wrong, in fact, that we neglected it. Uh, and I think in the, in the more recent years, we have made efforts um, to uh, make up for the mistakes we made in the early part. And things like the, um, the, uh, the, uh, the program within the Department of Energy that deals with integrated assessments, perhaps, was one example where we tried to make amends in some way. It's still, in my opinion, uh, not enough. It's certainly one area of science that gets neglected. It's not just uh, in the environmental and the climate programs, but it's also in biology and medicine, quite frankly. And uh, I think we need to be very, a lot more sensitive about the need to invest in the social sciences for many of these programs. Thank you for asking it. I'm just troubled by what seem to be some contradictions. You've written this report in the context of climate change, and yet you seem to be supporting fossil fuels as our source of energy when you say fracking is an indication of progress technologically. And I've seen sound evidence of widespread contamination of groundwater from fracking, especially in Pennsylvania. Nuclear energy, Jacques Cousteau has put together compelling data comparing the amount of sun and how much energy we would derive from it versus what a nuclear energy would be able to provide in addition to the enormous costs of an, a nuclear plant and the harms from the radiation that is admitted 24-7 in addition to the spent fuel issues. So I'm hoping that your report, which I look forward to reading, has additional or at least a, a greater emphasis on renewables. Can you maybe elaborate on that, please? Um, well, I think, I mean, what more can I say? Uh, except, uh, let me know what you think about the report. Um, I mean, your comments, thank you for your comments. And next question. <laughs> Let me add a little bit. You know, the, the, uh, the issue of fracking is something that's happening as we speak. Uh, and whether we take a position on this, we, we may have very little influence in whether fracking continues or not. But what uh, Kay has described is we need to have that ability. We need to have the science. Uh, and the research in order to ascertain whether there is damage, as you've described. Um, so th it's not like we are, we are endorsing or advocating continuation of fracking. We are rather neutral on it. We just want to make sure the scientific tools is there, are there so that we know whether there is long-term or even short-term damage. And with respect to the nuclear energy uh, question that you raised, read our report because Yes, you, you, you make some good points about that, but there are also other issues that may not be at least initially very obvious why we need to have uh, a, a hand in the nuclear industry business. So read the report. Um, over here first. My name is uh, Joe Heijer. I'm with the um, Energy Futures Initiative. And Kay, I'm wondering if you could, this may be taking it a, a little bit beyond where your report left off, but 
it appears that Congress will restore a number of these funding cuts in the current appropriation cycle if, if and when they ever get to a final omnibus bill. And, uh, but nonetheless, I'm wondering just the fact that the uncertainty that's been created by the proposals, whether you see that having, already seeing it having uh, adverse impacts on these programs. And do you think that this continual, what, what may be a kind of a yo-yo cycle that may continue for the next couple of years, do you think that in and of itself will have some uh, adverse impacts here? Um, you're right that it's outside the report, but I think the short answer is yes, it's having an impact. I mean, I, I don't know how many of us have spent time, you know, in the executive branch working there, but you ca it cannot help but have an impact to have your program, the one you're working on, be proposed for elimination. I mean, that is demoralizing, even if at the end of the day or at the end of the month, um, appropriations are restored. So that, this has an impact on people's careers, on, on, on agencies' you know, operations, uh, and of course on the long-term nature of both people's careers and the, and the protection of climate and environment, R&D programs, and the, the research results that depend on sustained, reliable federal funding. So yes, I mean, it's having an impact. Um, and that's one of the things I'm afraid of. Uh, the other thing I'm afraid of uh, with, once again, I hope next week's omnibus, is that because you know, these proposed cuts, as I described them, are spread out over 13 different federal agencies and you know, numerous programs, which is why this report is so thick, um, I am nervous that uh, you know, Congress will not save them all. Um, and there will be damage that will be sustained within the 2018 appropriations, and that's going to compound, I think, the damage that has already been done with this, as you describe it, the yo-yo effect of now it's been you know, 10 months since the detailed budget for 2018 came out. So that's 10 months of uncertainty in you know, federal scientists and other uh, government employees' careers. It's 10 months of uncertainty at the program level of whether they'll even be around uh, after next week. Um, so, you know, I do worry about that. And it might, well, if, if there is a follow-up report, I think we're going to want to at least dig into some examples of what uh, this budget cycle and the next budget cycle have meant for this portfolio. Well, I would add, uh, the, just the, um, the, this agony of the last 10 months that uh, Kay described is discouraging many students that are now undergraduates and are thinking about graduate careers, uh, picking a sort of uh, topics for their dissertations and so on. I, I know already that there are many individuals who have decided for alternative careers, alternative paths, and that's a loss that may have long-term impacts. I would also just mention that, again, just from sort of very ad hoc anecdotal um, experience, that in terms of any number of people who have left federal agencies, um, have done so because of concerns about what was happening in terms of projected cuts or elimination of program. And I also know of any number of people who've been recruited to agencies overseas. Uh, because of the uncertainty of, of what was going to happen with regard to continued budgets and, and funding here. And one of the things that over the years that I've also observed is that when you lose a lot of senior people or you know, people at, at mid-levels in agencies or in terms of thinking about academia, that you lose so much institutional history and knowledge that is really difficult to replace and that that is a substantial loss that we just need to be aware of because it really does have an impact in terms of thinking about how we, how we carry on and, and really make the most of, 
of what we can do with, with budget dollars and how those dollars are invested. So we, um, a couple other questions? Okay, a question here and then over here. Uh, in answering the question what to do, I wasn't expecting you or ESI to say this is our program. Uh, certainly advocacy groups such as ESI have to protect themselves and can't enunciate a specific political program. But what to do is a question for all of us, I agree. Uh, whatever resistance this Congress might provide in the next few weeks with regard to 18 or in the near future with regard to 19, uh, nonetheless the proposals have been made. Mm -hmm. And the question of what to do about a sense uh, emanating from executive leadership uh, that these kinds of cuts are a reasonable thing to do. I mean, who's to say that your analysis is not a fake analysis? Uh, there's a, a disregard, even a disdain for knowledge that has crept into our national psyche. And I, w the question what to do is as much about that as it is this specific budget year's proposals, which are not good, or next year's, which are not good. Uh, I wasn't, I, I look forward to a larger discussion where people can actually suggest programmatically what to do. That is a larger discussion. And uh, so I got to let that hang there as this question for all of us. I mean, I will say, I think my involvement in this report shows that, you know, my response is we continue to provide knowledge. And that's why, you know, I was interested in, in being involved in this report because the budget table, I went over it quickly. That's my, my area, right, of providing the budget table. Uh, but most of the, the discussion was about, I hope it's new knowledge or knowledge that is being, resur being surfaced for this discussion. And you know, what happens to the, this report? That's not under my control or our control. Um, the only thing that I can do is to put it out there and do what I can, including in fora like this one, uh, to communicate what it's about. So. And obviously, it's important to have an understanding of what is behind the numbers. Uh, yeah. Michael, did you? Uh, thank you very much. A follow-up question driven by the earlier remark about renewables. Did you drill down into the national laboratory budgets of DOE, including the National Renewable Energy Lab budget and the other national labs, to figure out where the R&D cuts in the Department of Energy would really hit on terms of the national laboratories? I mean, that, that actually was a deliberate decision on our part not to focus on the, the, the renewable energy, energy efficiency investments that are primarily in the Department of Energy. So, you know, initially we thought about would do, does it make sense to focus on the clean energy investments as well as the climate and the environmental R&D investments? So we chose, we chose to, you know, not to deal with those investments, which means we did not really look at uh, NREL and some of the other uh, energy laboratories and what they were doing and what, what would be happening to them. Um, partially because, you know, other, other organizations, uh, we were told, were d working on similar studies. Um, so, but, you know, if you take those two pieces together, what's happening with the clean energy, uh, portfolio and what's happening to climate and environment portfolio, then you get, I guess, a, a, a broader story. Uh, and I think it ha what happens to be the same story. Um. And I've been associated with the Department of Energy since 1974 and continue to be in one form or another. So to answer your question, yes, the, uh, the programs in energy efficiency and renewable energy uh, in terms of the, the proposals have been significantly cut. Uh, whereas the, the programs for the National Nuclear S uh, S uh, S uh, Science Administration uh, have been significantly increased. And I would just add that in terms of the Office of um, Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy, in terms of the programs all funded under that, I think it, once again in terms of looking at the um, the budget request would be for a 72% cut overall for efficiency in renewable, um, which includes obviously um, any number of program eliminations. Any other last questions? Um, 
If not, I just wanted to ask whether there were any last words from from Ari or from Kay. Well, I would I would add it since uh, uh, Kay brought it up. Uh, we are contemplating a follow-up review uh, report and, and study. Uh, at this point, we need to confer with our advisory committee, and we're going to get input. Um, if we are always open for suggestions from the broader community about studies of this type, and we will consider it, and I'm on board. perhaps undo it. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Thank you very and, much. And to, and to that, obviously, reactions input um, from all of you today is also useful in terms of all of the thinking of, of the Novim team as well as others in, in terms of thinking about where questions are and aspects that should perhaps be explored. So I want to thank you all for coming and being part of this discussion. Urge you to look carefully at the report, share it with others. Um, we just need to make sure that we understand and are as thoughtful and as well versed as possible in terms of understanding what is being requested and moving forward. And I want to say thank you very, very much, Kay and Ari. We really, really appreciate your being here and talking with us today about that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.